very different for you. That's what it is. <laughs> um, <clears throat> uh, my name is Michael Quinn. I'm uh, a communications professor from Manhattan College. And I say this partly because it's relevant for my presentation. So basically, in 2019, Manhattan College, which is in New York City, began streaming basketball games on ESPN, which is which is a sports network, uh, on their app, which is ESPN Plus or ESPN Three. They have two. They have multiple apps. Using students from a newly created concentration that we just created, the sports media concentration. After you know, COVID started to very slowly wind down, it's still there. I, I'm, I also have COVID. Um, but in 2021, and things started to get back a little bit to normal at my college, I decided to start working on a, a very small case study that was exploring how uh, we put this together, and mostly I put this together, uh, pedagogy-wise successes and issues that we're having. So this is going to be a very small case study in comparison to, to what we just heard. So just briefly, so you know exactly what I'm talking about here, um, there's three staff members. There's a professor, myself. There's a producer, director, and lecturer of the games who teaches advanced classes, and he and he directs the productions. And then there's an engineer to make everything's running, to make sure everything's running. Uh, we need a minimum of eight students, uh, four students on camera, one on graphics, one on audio, one on replay, and one technical director who switches amongst all of these different pieces of technology. So this is student run with the exception of the producer director, student generated content for ESPN plus, as we'll talk a little bit about at the end, this is the very definition of a public private partnership in education uh, with, its, with its good and bad points. We do this and have done this since 2019 for 40 games a year, 20 men's basketball, 20 women's basketball, and then a few other things as needed. And to be clear, these are this is all live and it's streamed. You can't turn in your television, but you can watch it on an app. And if you have an app on your television, you can watch it there. So um, before getting going, here's our production truck. And this is the interior of the production truck and the different pieces of equipment will tighten here. Uh, there's me, I'm normally not there. <laughs> there's our director and some of the students sitting at the various stations. So what was interesting about this when I was hired to start to do this, I've taught production before, but in this case, the, the classes could succeed in the sense that I could teach production effectively, but the actual program fail. We could not successfully get uh, valid games on, on the streaming network, or we could do it sometimes, not on all of them. Or it could be reversed. We could get the streams online, but we the classes would not be any good. So it was clear to me that we were going to need a very clear movement in the classes and in the program in general from beginning students to advanced students. That since I'm at a liberal arts school at a, at a college, there had to be connections to the humanities and the liberal arts in terms of an approach, which is going to be more in my paper than here just for time, but um, keep that in mind. And that it was going to have to emphasize two things. The performance aspect of live production, these students are performing as much as they are making videos because they're doing it live. And the teamwork production, the teamwork aspects, they're doing it as a group. So unlike what I normally do when I start teaching, <laughs> I felt this required a pretty clear pedagogy with a theoretical approach to make sure that both pieces of this were gonna work. And that's what this is about. I've heard Lev, Ga Lev Vygotsky talked about a bit in the previous the previous uh, panel before this one. So just briefly, Soviet era psychologist who worked in uh, development theories for childhood development um, a little bit before and then contemporaneous with Jean Piaget, uh, a bit before his theories, Piaget's theories were popularized. Levatsky has become popular recently because he's interested in the sociocultural aspects of learning. So how learning can be done interpersonally. In fact, has to be done in interpersonal interactions and within interactions in a pre-existing social network, which is a bit different from Piaget, who's much more about independent learning. So it, it, the basic idea is that knowledge, and this is you know this is skill-based knowledge, but I think it's also other kinds of knowledge, becomes interiorized through interacting with and or constructing a social environment, which of course includes people. So how to apply this? Uh, Kevin Wood, uh, who 
was an early Vygotskyan came as the concept of transfer responsibility, which is what we were looking for. We needed students to work independently within a team. We needed them to correct errors without being told with automaticity. So very quickly without even thinking about it. And we needed peer collaboration to happen. And applying these three things that I think we needed to do were Bogazzi's theory of scaffolding, which I'll talk about in a second, a sense of collaborative learning. And my favorite part of this, that was a joke, not my favorite part, <laughs> continual assessment of the students at, at every point in this process. So briefly before going on, uh, these are the five pieces of equipment they're, they're, they have to learn throughout the program. This case study focuses on the camera specifically um, because this would get quite large if I was going to do all the pieces of equipment. So uh, this is particularly camera operation. So with scaffolding, I'm going to talk about that for a second. That is providing initial support to the learner and then in stages, removing or finding alternate modes of support until the learner can work independently. The, the classic scaffolding analogy is learning to ride a bicycle. The learner usually has a teacher present who is probably holding the learner still. And usually um, training wheels are attached to the bicycle. So the, the learner almost can't fall. And then as the learner gets more confident, the training wheels are removed. The teacher might do less physical holding of the holding upright of the of learner until eventually the learner can just go on their own. This is, the analogy often stops there, but it continues. I mean, if you want to become a professional cyclist, you have to learn from peers, which I think is important for, from Fogoski and from books and from professionals. So this definitely all tied into what we're doing. So how I was gonna apply this, breaking tasks, breaking tasks into groups, I'm sorry, breaking tasks into stages, providing exercises at each stage, so a lot of assignments and a lot of mini exercises, providing constant feedback and utilizing another Vygotskyan concept, the zone of proximal development, which is, yeah. So the zone of proximal development is part of scaffolding. He theorized that what's interesting about pedagogy is the difference between the actual the student's actual level and their possible level at a given time. And that's, that's why it's a zone, it's the zone of their development. For his theory, and it seemed to work in this case, as I can talk about in a second, what this allows for is very specific collaborative learning and peer mentorship. Once you have placed a student within their zone, you know what they can do, but also where they're going, and you can attach them to students who have were at that place. If you put them with students who are much above that, and that becomes a different relationship becomes that becomes a mentor relationship. So it becomes possible to really place people very precisely. It gives you a systematic approach to skills, specifically skill acquisition. Um, I can't speak about um, other things at this point, but skill acquisition, which is what I'm doing. And it also can give you very localized feedback because you are dealing with students present level and the anticipated level. So you're not going to tell them they can't do something that you would never expect them to be able to do. You can tell them, here's the next stage you need to be at, and here's what you need to get there. This is a little pyramid that we use to make our first set of rubrics. This might be difficult to read. At the bottom, things are possible for students to accomplish with assistance. So for example, our students will not leave this program being able to make a Hollywood feature film. So we're not even counting that as part of it. Next is impossible within the live performance time frame. So maybe they can operate the cameras and do certain things, but they can't do it live. This goes all the way up to independent work. So we modified this. I'll get to that in a second. For camera operation, dividing it into five different things the students have to do. Focus, exposure, white balance, composition, so composing the shots and then camera movement, which of course is related to composition, and then five different levels approximating the five le appropriate levels of the um, of the zone of proximal development. From the most simple thing the student should learn very quickly to the most complex things that the student has to do. Getting back to my picture, um, I hope this is possible to see. I probably get it with the circle pen better. This particular case today I'm going to talk about is with one of our 
three cameras, one of our four cameras, excuse me, camera three. Here's the person behind the basket, a little bit underneath. And this is a shot from that particular camera. So, if you know, basketball, they're getting foul shots, they're getting dunks, they're getting half court offense and this kind of stuff. It's often used for replays. So it's a, a significant position and it's, even though they're sitting, you might not be able to see, the camera's attached to them. So it's actually fairly difficult and it's uh, not the first thing we do. So our rubric that we gave them took those five elements, the focus, exposure, white balance, composition, and movement, and turned that into beginning and beginning through to advance uh, categories. So everything that was out of focus, for example, to they could consistently stay in focus, or they can't just find they just can't find the ball, <laughs> they just keep losing the ball handler. To they can follow the game despite any sudden changes that happen in the game. And this we could follow them through assignments through all of these stages. So for example, early on we might have a student shoot one of their friends outside with a camera. Um, friends running away from the camera, can they focus them? Can they do the exposure correctly? Can they keep them, can they keep a correct composition? So we developed exercises basically for each stage of this at each element. So results, that was my time. Oh, my time is rapidly running out. So four students over two years, as I said, it's a very, very small case study, uh, just briefly, partly because of COVID and partly because I didn't start right away. Uh, we're growing rapidly. I follow these four students from the introductory course to program completion, track the rubrics, gave them a questionnaire, um, and talked about that and also mentioned their internship and job placement success they've had since then. Um, my N is four. I have no standard deviation for you or uh, very many complex statistics, but this follows how the students were able to improve fairly rapidly. A 2.0 students were able to work in games and by week three one of the students one of the students was able to start working on a game which was astonishing to me and not something i expected by week nine three of the four were able to do that so the improvement was happening throughout uh the program questionnaire result was really interesting because the students all felt themselves confident before they were trained and as you see, I did not <laughs> in coming up with their coming with the rubrics. They did. So they have they literally forgot what it went into their training, which I found really interesting. By the end of the program, they felt themselves extremely comfortable. This was done on a Likert scale, so the, the stats are a little different, but they felt themselves extremely comfortable with uh with their position. Brief discussion, running out of time here. Uh we were able, as I said at the beginning, we were able to successfully do this 40 games a year, 120 hours approximately of stream content. Uh, two of the four students were hired during the spring semester for graduation. One of them is going to grad school, one of them, fingers crossed. Uh, perhaps more importantly, all four of them were hired in season as freelance production operators at other schools. So we felt this was able to get across outside of what we were doing. Let me skip a bit. Oh, I could just go to the issues and concerns with the projects. Obviously, extremely small sample size, that's going to change. Um, more significantly for what I was doing, there's no control group here. Uh, and I think I need that for what I'm doing. So the more traditional production teaching where you might have a bit more of a lecture and you teach students how to use equipment and then you send them out uh, to do things, that might be equally as, equally as effective. And that's is gonna be the next stage of this since we teach that kind of traditional production too, as, as have I. There was continual assessment. If you followed me, you probably figured that out. Um, the more students we get, the more unmanageable that will become. So I'm going to have to modify that. And th there's some theory that scaffolding becomes quite rote. Um, and I have to try to de-emphasize that. My paper, this is my last slide, uh, my paper talks a little bit about, at the very at the very end, about what it is like to do skills-based education at the liberal arts college. More significantly, I think, um, than that, is this idea of public-private partnership and the relationship between that and college education. So to put it frankly, our students are unpaid. In fact, they're paying us and they're generating profit for ESPN. Uh, that made me initially fairly uncomfortable, <laughs> as you can imagine. Getting students employed has made me happy, so I'm, I'm less uncomfortable with that as I, as I was, but it is definitely an issue and we'll talk and discussion as to 
should this be something colleges do in the future? And lastly, liberal arts college. So to what extent are, is this kind of collaboration since we had a lot of peer mentoring, I, had, I, I cut some of that for time, tons of peer mentoring and collaboration. This iterative assignments, we would repeat the assignments over and over each week as students got better and scaffolding in more traditional humanities and liberal arts assignments. And that is it, that's as fast as I could do. <laughs> Thank you, everybody.